Thank you to um, Northwestern's uh, Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Health and Wellbeing. Um, this is such an amazing opportunity to um, have this event. Um, thank you for bringing me onto the planning committee. Um, and I think this is um, such a, a unique opportunity um, and, and for this panel to really showcase uh, the evidence base for uh, the disparities and challenges that LGBTQ plus people are facing in STEM fields. Um, this is really a very um, relatively new area of work as we'll see, um, you know, why it's so new and why there are so few studies is mostly because of the lack of data. Um, but we have some of the leading experts on um, these uh, issues, and so we're very fortunate to have them. Um, and I'll just quickly <clears throat> introduce our panelists before I give um, some uh, remarks first. So we have. Joel Middleman, who is assistant professor um, at the University of Notre Dame. Christine Wood, who is research assistant professor at Northwestern University. Bryce Hughes, who is associate professor at Montana State University. Tom Wydzunas, who is associate professor at Temple University. Uh, Reginald Blockett, who is assistant professor at Auburn University. And Stephanie Farrell, who is professor at Rowan University. Um, <clears throat> so by way of introduction, um, I don't do STEM education uh, workforce research. I look at the neural mechanisms underlying less conscious forms of bias um, using a variety of techniques. And I think this sort of work on less conscious forms of bias and how this gets expressed inform my perspective on the issue of LGBTQ plus challenges in STEM. And once I got tenure in 2018, um, I wrote a piece for Nature um, on how um, LGBTQ plus scientists are um, left out, not included in uh, mainstream diversity initiatives, um, and yet there is growing evidence of these alarming disparities that LGBTQ plus people are facing. And I became quite concerned about this, um, both from personal experiences and from hearing from junior faculty and graduate students and postdocs, um, and so wanted to speak out and advocate that we should be included in, in official diversity initiatives. Um, <clears throat> some of the evidence suggesting this, and I, I wanted to include um, a, a couple pieces of evidence because we don't have um, those panelists to talk about it here. Um, but uh, one very early estimate looked at federal employees, because that is where the only data existed, and um, found that when you look at federal STEM agencies versus non-STEM agencies, um, so just looking at the federal government, um, you can come to this estimate of about you know, 17 to 21% um, less represented in, the, in STEM agencies than is expected based on um, the, that uh, prevalence in the US population at that time. So this really isn't a great handle on the STEM workforce, right? Federal employees is just one very you know, limited sector of that, but it was all that was available at that time. Most recently, um, Dario Sansone and colleagues have found that um, using the American Community Survey, which doesn't have a sex orientation measure, but it does allow people to indicate if they're in other sex or same-sex couples, found that men in same-sex couples are 12% less likely to complete an undergraduate STEM degree than men in other sex couples. Um, you also can see this in terms of um, uh, who's in a STEM occupation versus non-STEM occupation, um, a, a similar kind of underrepresentation, and the gap size in STEM bachelor's degrees was sort of intermediary between um, uh, the racial gap in terms of white individuals earning um, more STEM degrees than black individuals and the gender gap in terms of win women earning fewer STEM degrees than men. Um, this was also replicated with another um, survey from the CDC, the National Health Interview Survey, which found, which did have a sex orientation measure, so it doesn't have that caveat of only dealing with um, couples, and also found that there was a similar underrepresentation. Interestingly, this gap was not found for um, sexual minority uh, women in STEM, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, all, besides, you know, underrepresentation, when you look at community surveys and other data sets, some of which um, I know uh, Tom Wydzunas is going to be speaking about briefly, um, <clears throat> but uh, you can see all, all sorts of issues in terms of LGBTQ plus people are reporting more negative workplace experiences, are more likely to experience career barriers and workplace harassment. Um, they're not uh, out, so 70% of sexual minority STEM faculty members who are out at work report feeling uncomfortable in their department, um, or 40% um, of LGBTQ plus people and STEM are not out to colleagues, according to one estimate. And then some STEM fields have conducted internal surveys, like the American Physical Society, finding that there are significant issues um, and these negative experiences predict a desire to leave STEM. <clears throat> 
In a paper in 2020, um, I tried to integrate these uh, emerging insights and um, in terms of at least three factors that might be driving these disparities. Um, and because there's such few data, the causal mechanisms are really you know, poorly understood at this stage. But of course, anti-LGBTQ plus bias and discrimination, there's still plenty of that going on in the general workforce. And it, it's plausible that could apply to STEM as well. Um, I think uh, STEM stereotypes in terms of the beliefs and expectations of who the ideal scientist is, uh, that are masculine, heterosexual, and cisgender. Um, these could be leading STEM practitioners, faculty members in terms of making their decisions about who is fit for STEM cultures, as well as um, uh, um, LGBTQ plus people themselves um, internalizing that and how they see themselves as fitting or not fitting for STEM cultures. And I think those gendered masculine STEM stereotypes in particular might be explaining some of the asymmetries that are being observed between sexual minority men and sexual minority women. And then also I think unique STEM norms of impersonality that isolate LGBTQ plus people um, and this idea that you know in academia you need to um, compartmentalize your personal from your professional life. You're supposed to move to any geographic location for higher order purposes of science. And, you, and it, I think there's unique norms of impersonality that prevent identity disclosures and prevent LGBTQ plus people from being sufficiently out. And we know from the general workforce that um, not being out in the workplace leads or is associated with self-reported anxiety and um, less job satisfaction. I've been quite focused on the issue of data because I see that the you know having comprehensive nationwide data is crucial to the ability to develop data-driven policies, to enact change, to allow policymakers, government agencies to be able to do something about these disparities, as well as of course allow researchers to better understand these issues. And I won't go into the details, but really this is um, the primary job of the National Science Foundation in terms of its um, uh, nationwide survey. So what um, is sort of the most known survey here is the survey of earned doctorates, which um, since 1957, everyone who's received a PhD is typically required by their doctoral institution to complete the survey before graduating. Uh, NSF collects the data, it then sends doctoral institutions back the data. Also there's probability samples of um, college graduates in the US as well as um, doctoral recipients from 18 to 76 years old in terms of, so effectively allowing NSF to see what's the new PhD class every year and then also what happens to the college graduates and the doctoral degree holders in the US. And these uh, turn into uh, biennial reports to Congress um, uh, the Women, Minorities, and Persons with Disabilities in Science and Engineering Report and the Science and Engineering Indicators Report, which then go to Congress, to policymakers, to NIH, to other offices at NSF, to universities across the country, to researchers and scientific organizations. Um, and I, um, you know, in, I've been advocating since 2018 for NSF to ask sex orientation and gender identity questions in a voluntary basis um, on these surveys, and it's. It, when we look at other agencies like the Department of Education, um, the, the sort of knee-jerk response of, well, we couldn't possibly ask these questions, these are invasive or these are sensitive. When we look at other agencies' surveys, um, this is from the Department of Education, and look at sort of the indices that federal statistical agencies use to look at sensitivity reactions. So um, if, if respondents are uncomfortable with the question, they're going to exit the survey when they see the question, which is break-off rates. They're going to skip the question, item non-response rates, or they're going to take longer to complete. And this is from um, Elise Christopher's data sets at the Department of Education, who fortunately is with us um, uh, for this event. Um, and the, the point um, to see here is that when we look at assigned sex at birth, gender identity, and sexual orientation questions, these all elicit fewer sensitivity reactions and take um, fewer seconds to complete than, um, uh, than comparable questions like income and disability, right? If anything, income and disability cause more issues than assigned sex at birth, gender identity, and sex orientation on, um, on federal surveys. Um, if we were to have SOGI questions, sex orientation and gender identity questions included in NSF surveys, it would allow researchers and policymakers to track LGBTQ plus disparities and the career and educational barriers that um, LGBTQ plus people face, of course, in intersection with um, race, gender, economic background, et cetera. Allow for the development and testing of strategies to increase the retention of LGBTQ plus people in STEM if and where there are leakages in the pathways. Help universities, funding agencies, and scientific societies prevent or stop bias and pathway issues. 
inform directly NSF and NIH diversity initiatives like the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program or the NIH National Research Service Awards or NIH R01 diversity supplements um, and university diversity initiatives for the recruitment and advancement of uh, faculty and trainees. And also I think help change the conversation in STEM more broadly, the fact that this information would be included in official surveys and reports, I think makes it recognized as an official form of scientific workforce diversity. And so um, since 2018, I've been advocating for this, fortunately, um, in collaboration with the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Educational Research Association, and um, at, at various points up to 90 scientific organizations or 17 scientific organizations and um, a variety of scientists. And if you've supported this effort, I um, thank you for it. Um, Basically, in terms of where we're at now, um, at, in April 2021, after years of delays, NSF finally initiated piloting of SOGI questions. Um, it almost omitted sex orientation, um, but did ultimately include sex orientation into the pilot. Um, and what happened most recently is that in December um, of 2022, NSF did decide for the first time to move forward with an expanded gender question um, in its national survey of college graduates happening right now, which is phenomenal news. Um, it did take issue with the sex orientation question and excluded it from the 2023 workforce survey. Um, there were significant concerns with NSF's analyses um, that it used to justify not moving forward with sex orientation. Um, for example, not testing how it compares with income and disability as its peer statistical agencies have done. Um, and NSF declined to provide data to alleviate the concerns that were raised, um, which did raise significant concerns and so um, led to a um, sign on to the, um, to the NSF director and to other government agencies um, and um, uh, the White House OSTP um, which 1,700 scientists signed on to, um, asking NSF to reconsider its decision due to these scientific concerns with its analyses and also to publicly release its pilot data um, to be open and transparent. Um, and the, um, so this got some media attention um, and fortunately caught the attention of um, 18 U.S. senators. So this was spearheaded by Tammy, uh, Senators Tammy Baldwin and Dianne Feinstein. Um, and uh, 18 U.S. senators wrote um, NSF leadership um, sort of converging with our, um, in our letter and asking NSF to um, try to assess LGBTQ plus representation in STEM as soon as possible with SOGI data to abide by some recent executive orders and a changing federal policy landscape so that NSF can implement federal policies related to scientific workforce diversity, as with other underrepresented groups. Um, this led to a couple other uh, subsequent things, um, and, and the NSF um, responded in terms of it will release data, but it, it did s still take issue with the sex orientation question. Um, and so there was um, a response to NSF asking them to sort of giving suggestions as to how it could reanalyze its data, but also to try to be more transparent moving forward. So to allow the public as it's lawfully you know, allowed to do, to give comments on um, its SOGI piloting plans and methodologies to avoid some of the methodological issues that have occurred over the past uh, five years. And fortunately, um, NSF um, uh, did for the first time in its announcement of the, the, its plans for the survey of earned doctorates, did for the first time give the public the ability to comment on its SOGI piloting plans and methodologies, so sort of a new era of transparency um, and um, openness, which is uh, greatly appreciated. Um, and also an exciting new um, piloting program asking 20 unique combinations of SOGI questions on the full census of newly minted PhDs in the US for the upcoming survey of earned doctorates about to start in July. So these are really exciting changes um, and um, I you know responded um, in terms of um, there were some methodological concerns with specifically how it intends to ask the questions and fortunately a number of LGBTQ plus advocacy groups um, I alerted them to um, these plans and the human rights campaign Whitman Walker the Fenway Institute movement advancement project and the national LGBT cancer network who have expertise in federal data collection and LGBTQ plus equity um, also chimed into NSF to um, uh, converge on uh, some of the letters assessments and um, try to advise NSF on um, best ways to do this and NSF as of a couple weeks ago, did um, not do everything, but it did revise some of its piloting plans. These are really, um, you know, exciting. I think new era with NSF in terms of transparency, openness, um, taking the public's consideration and, and experts on LGBTQ plus equity and federal data collection, um, and allowing that to happen. Um, 
So um, I want to thank NSF for that. Um, and um, where we're at now is um, NSF is piloting, um, repiloting on the National Survey of College Graduates. It's, as I mentioned, on um, initiating a pilot on the full census of surveyor and doctorate, so it's about 57,000 new PhD recipients. And it's also soon about to announce um, a pilot of SOGI questions on the full probability sample of um, the survey of uh, doctorate recipients, so about 130,000 doctoral degree holders, um, what happened to them after they got their PhD in the US. So these are really exciting large-scale pilot changes. And the timeline, um, the optimistic timeline, is that um, in this academic year, 2023-2024, um, there's the um, comprehensive new pilot data being collected by NSF in the academic year 2024-25. Hopefully, if all goes well, NSF could officially include SOGI questions in these surveys to provide official statistics for the very first time. In 2026, we would have the first nationwide data set um, with uh, SOGI questions made available. And then potentially, um, uh, NSF could decide um, to include these data in uh, NSF's Women, Minorities, and Persons with Disability in Science and Engineering report, which goes to Congress in 2027. Um, it might be renamed to the Diversity in STEM report, um, just given you know, the, the emphasis on, on just women. Um, <clears throat> but the, this is sort of an optimistic timeline. Um, and again, you know, why I think and others think this is so important is because the whole ecosystem um, and the ability to affect change in STEM, uh, STEM education in the workforce, I think really hinges on the, the, these pivotal data sets. And I think this, what would, um, you know, with these data, it would create a snowball effect of allowing researchers to better understand the issues, obviously policymakers to do something about it and enact change, um, and also allow more grants to be funded on this issue and sort of create a whole, um, a whole set of pathways to better understand this. I also want to just do a brief shout out that, you know, I've been focusing um, on, on federal data, um, but as you're seeing, right, these data go to university diversity offices, and universities, of course, play a major role in STEM education in the workforce. And i um, very pleased to say that um, AAAS and I were able to get um, a $2 million award um, from a philanthropy, um, Tiger Global Impact Ventures, um, to look at, you um, know, kind of multi-stage process to understand what are SOGI data practices happening at US universities, um, and then do a federal and state policy analysis, and then develop a couple um, reports, um, and effectively sort of hold, um, uh, hold the hands of university leaderships, a couple, and transition them to comprehensive SOGI data collection of their students and um, uh, employees um, in a legal and ethical manner um, so that, that, all, that universities could also play the role that they need to play in um, understanding and addressing these kinds of um, educational and career barriers that we're seeing. So with that, um, I just want to thank um, a number of individuals who've been so instrumental to these efforts, um, and then in particular AAAS and uh, AERA, as well as um, the UCLA Williams Institute and the Center for American Progress who have kind of helped at various points. and. Um, Thank you. And I will turn it now over to Joel Middleman. So it's a real honor and thrill to be here as part of this really important event. And I'm uh, happy to speak after John, because a lot of the uh, things I'll be addressing continue the themes that he was bringing up around data and the invisibility of LGBT populations and data. Um, so to provide uh, some context for the conversations we'll be having about STEM, I'm going to provide some uh, macro level data on the broad patterns of educational attainment among LGBTQ plus Americans. So I'm an assistant professor of sociology, but I'm also a demographer. And so as a demographer, I'm interested in questions like these. What are the population level patterns of educational attainment among America's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer adults? But before I address that question, I want to address another question, which is, why is that a surprisingly difficult question to answer? So let me start with that. So in um, 
it turns out that the issues that John's describing here in terms of uh, the invisibility of LGBT populations in our STEM data are indicative of a broader issue um, in which we historically have not asked about sexual orientation and gender identity in the big population representative data sets that uh, social scientists and demographers like myself as well as policymakers rely on um, to give us a picture of the American population. So in 2022, the National Academies put out a, a report synthesizing best practices for measuring sexual orientation and gender identity. And to motivate that, they explained that most national surveys uh, do not yet collect demographic data on sexual orientation or gender identity. And to put a number behind what most looks like, a 2020 review article found that of over 100 ongoing federal surveys, only 11 collected data on sexual orientation and fewer still collected information on gender identity. Uh, fortunately, we're in a period where um, things are changing excitingly, as evidenced by uh, this event, among other things. So uh, there was a lot of momentum during the Obama administration in starting to add uh, sexual orientation and gender identity questions to federal surveys. And then uh, under the Biden administration, there's been continued effort. So um, last year in his executive order, um, the Biden administration explained that advancing equity requires that the federal government use evidence and data to measure and address the disparities that LGBT plus individuals face. And in particular, uh, they um, made the uh, demand that the head of each agency should submit a sexual orientation and gender identity data action plan that would uh, detail how the agency plans to use SOGI data to advance equity. Um, and so as a result of that executive order last year, earlier this year, uh, this exciting document came out called the Federal Evidence Agenda. And I think that some of the people uh, who are instrumental in making this happen are in this room. So as both a citizen and as a social scientist, I thank you for your efforts here. Um, so as part of this uh, Federal Evidence Agenda, um, they asked, uh, they gave a series of illustrative questions of um, what are some of the things that we still need to know. And among those was, what's the distribution of educational attainment among LGBTQI plus people? So that brings me back to my first question here. So to answer this, I'm gonna be drawing on the National Crime Victimization Survey. Uh, there's a number of things you could say about that survey, but in this context, I wanna emphasize just a couple of things. One, it's a large nationally representative household survey. It's been going on uh, since 1972 in the United States. But since 2017, uh, it's collected information on both sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and then additionally, it has this detailed self-report of educational attainment. So I'm gonna give you some basic descriptive statistics from this data about the distribution of educational attainment in this population. So uh, here I'm gonna be presenting um, LGBTQ plus individuals and their cishet counterparts. So what we find here is that uh, actually if you look at bachelor's degree attainment, um, the LGBTQ plus population is comparatively quite, uh, has invested heavily in education. So about 47% of individuals who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer in these data uh, report having at least a college degree. And then if we go up the educational pipeline, uh, we see that this persists all the way through master's level and uh, these higher doctoral degrees of MDs, JDs, and PhDs. So thinking about 47% of uh, the population having a bachelor's degree, you may not have a good intuitive sense of um, what that kind of level of education looks like, so let me give you an intuitive sense. So uh, if you look at OECD data um, for the percent of adults in countries uh, that have the equivalent of a bachelor's degree or higher, the United States comes in ninth uh, internationally with about 36, 37% of, Amer of American adults having a BA. But if you were to separate out um, the LGBTQ plus population in the United States, it's the most highly it would be the most highly educated country in the world, tied effectively with Luxembourg. So um, let me immediately offer some context for interpreting this. So um, 
I do not mean for these uh, data to suggest that um, schools are actually safer, supportive environments for LGBTQ youth, right? So um, in my own research and in the research of others in this room, there's ample evidence that even today, even in some of our most progressive cities, um, queer students continue to be bullied at uh, substantially higher rates than their cishet peers. Um, and there's no relevant data in the National Crime Victimization Survey, but in some other data collected um, from the Department of Ed, I've shown that in the same data set where I find academic advantages for certain queer students, um, they nevertheless report feeling much less safe in school, right? So I'm not suggesting um, that actually schools are better than we thought for queer kids. Uh, no, what I'm trying to bring in is that uh, there's this underappreciated, um, tremendous resilience that we see academically for these populations. And then the other thing uh, that I want to offer as some context is that, you know, this academic investments uh, do not appear to reliably translate into broader socioeconomic advantages, right? So um, when you look at a picture like this, you might get the sense of, okay, well, you know, we know that there's health disparities, but maybe in terms of socioeconomic status, actually LGBT populations are doing pretty well. Uh, there's this long-standing myth of gay affluence that population representative uh, data refutes convincingly. And so um, here in the National Crime Victimization Survey, I have this uh, high distribution of educational attainment, and yet in the very same data set, if I look at uh, the predicted probability of poverty, um, LGBT uh, households have higher rates, significantly higher rates of poverty, right? So uh, this educational advantages should not be taken as indicative of a broader pattern of socioeconomic advantage. So what does this all mean for STEM? So the contributions I want to make are a couple. So given these general patterns of academic resilience and investment that we find among LGBTQ plus populations, um, the underrepresentation and the mistreatment of uh, LGBTQ plus populations in STEM is even more striking, right? And so um, there are STEM specific challenges here that we need to be understanding and addressing. We can't simply say uh, that queer populations are underrepresented in STEM because they struggle broadly academically. Actually, no, they're crushing it academically. Um, they're just being systematically funneled out of STEM um, and within STEM being mistreated. So hence the importance of the rest of the research that we'll be uh, hearing from. Thank you. Now we'll have uh, Christine Wood, who's research assistant professor at Northwestern. Turn this microphone down to match my height. Thank you so much. It's a real privilege to be here, and thank you to everyone who helped um, put this wonderful event together. Um, I won't spend too much time on my title slide. I'm Christine Wood um, from Northwestern um, Feinberg School of Medicine. Um, I'm going to be presenting data from two studies today, one of which focuses on high school students, um, which is a good complement to what Joel just presented, as well as some preliminary data from a qualitative study that I'm on. Um, I wanted to acknowledge a groundswell of attention to the lack of SOGI data that we have, and some of our wonderful colleagues, some of whom are here today, have provided personal testimony, as well as demands for more data in some of our highest profile publications like Science Magazine. Science, the predominant journal. So I'm going to talk today about training trajectories, and I want to familiarize everybody with the road to becoming a federally funded academic scientist. Um, I will present on high school data, um, which is a critically important time for aspiring STEM majors. Um, high school tends to be a period when interests are captivated. and um, Unfortunately, also where a high prevalence of bullying takes place for LGBTQ 
uh, students interested in STEM. And then um, towards the end of my talk, I will introduce a qualitative project on later training stages. Um, looking at decisions to pursue PhDs and continue in science, but also some of the barriers and complexities that LGBTQ people face um, when pursuing those fields. A little bit of context here. Um, the CDC publishes a um, survey, um, national data on um, youth experiences in high school. And as you can see from this um, very informative table, um, LGBTQ uh, students are much more likely to experience bullying on school property, um, uh, to become threatened um, on school property, or not go to school because they feel unsafe. That's a little bit of context for um, the experiences that sexual and gender minority students are facing currently, and this data is from 2019, as you see. First, I'll present on a talk um, that uh, a paper that I co-authored with uh, Dr. Brian Mustansky and some other folks at the Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Health on um, the quote unquote leaky pipeline for STEM recruitment among sexual and gender minority high school students. So the purpose of this study is to capture sexual and gender minority experiences in high school, um, specifically looking at um, sense of belonging in STEM classes and how welcoming students feel in their STEM classes in high school. So um, this is taken from a survey uh, called uh, SMART, which is um, the Sexual Minority Adolescent Risk-Taking Project. It's primarily an HIV prevention program for teens, but we did implement um, research questions on STEM intentions and the impacts of anti-SGM bullying on um, experiences in STEM coursework and also um, perceptions of STEM classroom environments, which we view as central to assessing the climate of STEM and also um, how captivated students are about eventually pursuing a STEM field. Okay, I'll go quickly through our sample, but um, the data is concentrated among um, late high school students ages 15 through 17. Um, it's a multiracial sample um, with a concentration of white and Latinx um, participants, but also black, African American, Asian, Native American, and multiracial um, populations. And as far as gender identity, um, the, pra the, the sample was um, originally targeted to um, men who have sex with men as it's an HIV prevention study. So our highest proportion of students come from the cisgender male and transgender male population um, with some data um, on cisgender and transgender women as well as non-binary people. But one limitation of the sample I acknowledge is that it's primarily an HIV prevention study for youth. Um, and then for sexual identity, um, the majority of students identify as gay and lesbian, but we also have representation from bisexual, pansexual, queer, and questioning students. Okay. So one of the primary things we're measuring in this study is students' sense of belonging in STEM learning environments. And to assess that, we asked a question on the survey about how excited you are to go to your math class, and then a separate question on how excited you are to attend science classes, and then how welcoming you think STEM fields are um, of LGBTQ individuals, and then another question on how welcoming STEM fields are for transgender and gender nonconforming individuals. Um, it's a, a complicated scale model, and um, we can talk, I'm happy to talk about the, these data in more detail later, but for the uh, purpose of this talk, I'll move on. So we did find some very interesting group differences in these results. Um, and though it was a small cell size, cisgender and transgender women have a significantly lower sense of belonging in math classes compared to cisgender men. Um, queer identified participants, interestingly, um, reported significantly lower self of, sense of belonging in math classes. Trans men um, found these fields to be less welcoming um, and STEM learning environments to be less welcoming for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and queer people. And gender nonconforming and non-binary students um, had a similar um, report around how welcoming STEM fields are. So 
what I want the big takeaway to be here is that our results um, showed high significance that experiencing anti-SGM bullying is significantly negatively associated with STEM sense of belonging in STEM learning environments. So high school students that experience anti-LGBTQ bullying on their high school campus lose their attachment to STEM fields and their interest in STEM fields. And we didn't see the same results with social sciences and humanities, by the way, so we do see this impact primarily um, towards STEM fields. Similarly, oh, and I also wanted to say that when you do have a high sense of belonging in your STEM and math classes, there's a correlation with your later intentions to enroll in STEM. So think about this as a pathway model. Um, if your sense of identity in STEM is interrupted early on, it's bad news for your eventual commitment to STEM. And similarly, experiencing anti-SGM, sexual gender minority bullying, was significantly negatively associated with perceived STEM climate. So similar to that, the perception that STEM fields and math are unwelcoming to LGBTQ youth, um, we see this coming out very strongly in the data. So uh, take a breath. <laughs> I want to take a breath because I'm going to talk really briefly about a qualitative research project that I've been working on for more than a decade now. Um, and some of our sexual and gender minority respondents in that study, and I'll go relatively quickly through this, but also highlight um, some words of experience from um, LGBTQ trainees in um, graduate school in science. So um, I have been working on a large um, federally funded, NIH funded longitudinal study of life scientists. And we do annual in-depth interviews with these trainees. Um, and for those who started PhDs, which was uh, N of 265, we have 34 self-identified sexual and gender minority people who pr filled out our pre-interview surveys before their interviews. And I wanted to focus on this um, this population in, in the study and during these um, interviews annually, we talk about things like science identity, why you enrolled in science initially, what compelled you to pursue a PhD and then later become an academic research scientist. Um, our uh, demographics, they're fairly um, diverse, uh, gender, mostly cisgender men and women um, and some uh, identification from trans women as well. So, um, our gender identity population is relatively balanced between cis men and women. Um, we haven't seen as much gender identity diversity. Uh, sexual identity fairly mixed among this SGM group, um, concentrated among gay and lesbian and bisexual. And our sample is also um, racially diverse, as one of the purposes of our study was to look at diversity and inclusion in STEM, and racial identity is a major aspect of that research. I wanted to highlight that um, we have overrepresentation of people who left PhD programs among our sexual and gender minority population. Um, both of those trans women I was mentioning, and even though there's only two, they did both leave their PhD programs. Um, I can uh, highlight why that is, but I want to bring out some of what we're seeing in our qualitative data. What factors influence experiences and decision making among sexual and gender minority biomedical scientists? Some of what we've seen, um, geographic choice, where am I going to work? Um, I have safety concerns. I don't want to live in a city where there's a small LGBTQ population. Um, a desire to do LGBTQ health research and not knowing how to do it. What's the pathway and where do I work? And I want to highlight that there's extreme NIH funding disparities for community health research. And we've seen that with black and African American scientists. Um, a high proportion of black and African American scientists are doing health disparities research. Same for LGBTQ scientists. And coming out and disclosing. Um, assessing your environment for whether it's safe to disclose and how to do so. And lastly, I just want to highlight some words from our SGM scientists that I've been discussing. Um, I'd like to work at an LGBT health center. I don't know how to make that happen. I feel safer in big cities. That's more comfortable for me. Um, and I've never been part of an organization for gays and lesbians, um, and I finally found one in grad school, so social supports are also spotty and limited, 
And I came out as trans to my friends, and I've been uh, moving through the pathway of coming out, but I'm not out professionally, and I don't know if I will be in the future. And ultimately, this person left her PhD program. So those are some contexts for what our LGBTQ students are saying at the higher training levels of PhD postdocs. And finally, what can we conclude from all of this? SGM scientists and aspiring scientists face specific barriers and complexities, as I highlighted. So bullying in the high school phases, and then later, um, decision making around a science career and how viable that is for someone from the SGM population or who wants to do SGM related research. Uh, I think mixed methods research provides missing links between what's reported on surveys and how we explain the processes and perceptions that form LGBTQ scientist experiences. Similarly with the gaps in data, we should structure our research questions around what we already know and what we don't know to fill gaps. Um, we need funding to do this research. That's absolutely imperative. Um, interventions are few and far between for SGM scientists, how to retain them and promote persistence. We need funding to do this work. And um, similarly, those interventions should be designed around what we know so far from the predominantly quantitative and qualitative data that we have, and be responsive to known barriers um, that LGBTQ scientists face. I'll stop now with acknowledgement to the um, NIH for the tremendous amount of support we've had for qualitative research. And then also thanks to Dr. Mustansky, um, Dr. Uh, Devashri Dekus, uh, Jagadisha, who uh, helped put this event together, everybody at the Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Health. Um, thank you so much. It's been an honor to speak today. And now we'll have uh, Bryce Hughes, who is associate professor at Montana State University. Good afternoon. Uh, as John said, I'm Bryce Hughes. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Education at Montana State University. And I wanted to share some of the work that I've done around looking at what factors affect and maybe what factors don't affect uh, the retention of LGBTQ students in STEM degree programs at the post-secondary level. I don't know if I need to establish the importance of this research for this group because I imagine that that's the reason that we're all here, but Policymakers have long emphasized the fact that we need to diversify the STEM workforce to address the historic underrepresentation of people from all kinds of groups, the ways that, that they've been systemically excluded from participation within fields that often contribute the most to the advancement of society in, in certain ways. Um, Recent social and political changes have pointed out the need to also focus on LGBTQ inclusion in a way that we haven't historically either been able to or historically sometimes just wasn't, um, was resisted by those in power. But as we've also established, there's limited data on how we're able to monitor LGBTQ involvement in STEM until recently. And so now that we're finally starting to see some of this data, we're also starting to see the problem in a new way that most of us have felt individually, but now we're able to also show in ways that, that speak to a broad range of audiences to be able to enact some kind of change on these issues. So the research that I've been involved with um, uh, looks at data on students who are in undergraduate STEM programs. Um, I had earned my PhD at UCLA and worked as a research associate in the Higher Education Research Institute that runs one of the largest national survey programs on college students in the US. So the data set that I had access to matched data that was collected when students entered college on the freshman survey with data that um, 
on a survey they filled out at the end of their fourth year of college called the College Senior Survey, which allowed for a look across where students were when they entered college and what majors that they aspired to at that point with what major they were still in at the end of that fourth year, which for some of them might be their last year of college. For many, if not most, was not quite the last year of college, but getting pretty close. Basically, the point at which I would imagine that they weren't about to change that major again after that fourth year. So in the data set that I used for this retention uh, analysis, it started with students who had entered college in the fall of 2011 with uh, matched with uh, where they were at the end of their fourth year in 2015, which led to an overall sample of about 4,000, a little over more 4,000 students who, when they entered college, said that they were intending to graduate with a STEM degree. 318 of those students were lesbian, gay, bisexual, or queer in, in that particular data set, which uh, were students pulled from 78 universities across the US. This was followed up with some work I collaborated on because of the limitations of that data set when it came to gender identity to look at the experiences of students who are transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming in STEM majors. We brought together several different administrations of these surveys from Harry to be able to get a pool of students who were trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming um, in a way that would allow for some meaningful statistical comparison. So we looked across four different administrations and um, we pooled four administrations, but they're all matched longitudinally in the same way, which out of the more than 21,000 students who aspired to a STEM degree across those four surveys, about 117 identified as trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming. Unsurprisingly, and I would imagine many of you have seen this, these numbers before, um, LGBTQ plus students are more likely to leave STEM majors in favor of non-STEM majors by the end of their fourth year of college. And there are all kinds of reasons why students might leave, and in fact, in, in many cases, it, like in my own case, although I finished my engineering degree, there was a point at which I said I didn't really want to be an engineer anymore, and maybe I should have thought about something else. Uh, some people made that decision a little bit quicker than their third year of college. Um, about 7% more LGBTQ students leave STEM majors by the end of their fourth year, and about 10% trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming students leave STEM majors before the end of their fourth year. What was surprising about this analysis, um, the LGBTQ analysis, not so much the TGNC analysis, was LGBTQ students are more likely to participate in undergraduate research, which research has long held is the most significant predictor for retention in STEM majors. And in fact, I pulled up some of the predictors from that initial analysis, just, I don't know how well you can see it, but just so you can see all of the different factors that were significant in that particular data set, and both undergraduate research and LGBTQ status were independently significant predictors of being retained in a STEM degree. Just LGBTQ status was a significant negative predictor, and undergraduate research was probably the strongest positive predictor in that, in that particular data set. Some of the other factors that are in here look a lot like other analyses that have been done on equity in STEM, such as, um, again, this data set using a binary variable for sex. Uh, women were less likely to persist in a STEM degree. Having a parent employed in STEM, you were more likely to persist. High school GPA, SAT score, um, and so on and so forth. Like a lot of these traditional predictors that we've seen in many different analyses. In looking at the, the analysis on trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming students, a couple factors stood out to us in that paper. One of them being that when we looked at variables related to their perceptions that are academic ability, so academic self-concept, as well as the kinds of factors that indicate engagement with science as undergraduates, working with faculty on research and having to search for research articles as a part of class, we saw no significant differences in that much larger data set um, that TGNC students have a pretty similar self-perception of their ability to do science. Uh, 
But to, non surprisingly, TGNC students are far more likely to be politically engaged, which I can imagine might come down to the fact that we, like, we've established there's not just a hostile climate in higher education, but there's a hostile climate wide, uh, broadly around trans non-binary and, and gender non-conforming identities that students are having to self-advocate on campus, off campus, and that may also be interfering with their well-being as well as their interest in, in persisting in, in science. In a separate follow-up analysis that I published with a graduate student in the Journal of Homosexuality, we took a look at a couple other predictors that were not STEM related to see if they might also help explain the persistence difference. And to some degree they did. I don't know if I would conclude that this is why. But when we added variables around experiences like taking women's studies courses, participating in LGBTQ organizations, seeking counseling, and so on, LGBTQ status was no longer a significant predictor in the model. And in particular, when we disaggregated the model by sexual identity, sense of belonging was a factor that was significant for LGBTQ students and not for heterosexual students. Altogether, I would say that this probably points to the structures and culture in science far more than it does these students' interest in or talent for uh, engaging with science which I think points again to the significance of why we're here together and what we hope to accomplish out of this symposium. Thank you. <clears throat> now I'll have Tom Wydzunas, who is a social professor at Temple University. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Wade. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Tom Wade and I am from Temple University, the Department of Sociology, and the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies program there. Um, the title of my presentation is STEM Professions and LGBTQ Inequality in the United States. It's really an honor to be part of this panel. I just have to say it's just kind of blowing my mind here to seeing all this is happening. Um, in my presentation, first, I will give an overview of the growing body of research in the, at the professional level of the STEM workforce, and then I'll talk about our STEM inclusion study that is um, the basis for the work that I'll talk about in the talk. I will then show results from two key published analyses from this ongoing project. First is on LGBTQ versus non-LGBTQ STEM professionals workplace experiences across the United States using a nationally representative survey based on professional societies. Uh, and second is an analysis on the effects of increasingly popular project-based work structures on LGBTQ uh, workplace experiences. These are uh, popular work structures where you bring people in from pools of, of engineers and scientists and technicians to work on projects um, for short periods of time. Okay, so at the professional level of the STEM workforce, Research has been, there's been a small amount, but it's been steadily growing within different workplace contexts and in STEM overall. Uh, when LGBTQ professionals are the sole focus of these studies, researchers uh, uncover forms of cis heteronormativity that is group experiences undermining inclusion and creating extra burdens of managing personal and professional lives that take up significant personal energy and resources. When comparing LGBTQ and non-LGBTQ populations, there are persistent patterns of disadvantage that hold up across professions and sectors showing higher rates of marginalization with some variation. And so this, this is some of the studies that look within academia, which has been an important starting point for research on LGBTQ STEM professionals. And then there have been um, some discipline uh, specific Studies uh, that show these patterns of disadvantages, such as the one that was studied done on LGBTQ plus physicists, um, and, and all across federal agencies, including NASA, NSF, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Department of Transportation. Then looking at STEM professions overall, um, which is the area that we're trying to do in our research, uh, research team Yoder and Matice 
uh, used the sampling method to study LGBTQA STEM professionals and found higher rates of marginalization measured as difficulty coming out. And then working with De Arellano, they subsequently developed a model of queer STEM identity development with an interview sample from their survey. Building on this work, the STEM inclusion study is an ongoing NSF-funded project and mixed method study led by Aaron Seck at University of Michigan and myself at Temple University. Aaron is the leader of the quantitative portion of the study, and I head up the qualitative interview side. Um, all of this research was done uh, before the pandemic and prior to the Bostock decision, so I should you know, historically situate it there. Um, and the uh, data for this mixed methods study was um, collected first in a survey that Aaron led from 2017 to 2019, involving surveys distributed to 21 STEM professional societies based in the United States. Eight of these are national flagship societies in natural life and physical sciences and mathematics. Five are national flagship societies in engineering. Six are interdisciplinary societies. And two are STEM teaching focused societies. The average response rate for the surveys was 20.1, typical of surveys of members of voluntary organizations, producing an overall end of 25,324, with 1,006 of these identified as LGBTQ. Uh, prior to getting this grant, Aaron and I piloted surveys at interviews at two NASA centers. At the end of both the NASA pilot survey and the STEM inclusion survey, respondents were asked whether they would be willing to be interviewed, and if so, their contact information was recorded with some demographic information. And this yielded two interview samples that I'm working with. First was a set of 27 interviews from two NASA centers that we analyzed under this grant. And we also gathered a nationwide sample now of 90 interviews through the STEM inclusion survey, study survey dispersed geographically across lesbian, gay, bi, pan, queer, straight, and transgender nonconforming groups, diversified across disciplines, across racial and underrepresented minority groups and employment sectors. The papers I'll talk about today um, are draw from the NASA sample and the large survey, and more work is forthcoming on the larger interview set. The first of our two papers uh, compares workplace experiences of LGBTQ professionals relative to their non-LGBTQ peers on a range of work experience measures and appeared in Science Advances in 2021 called Systematic Inequalities for LGBTQ Professionals in STEM. This table from the supplementary materials uh, shows demographics of the overall sample where LGBTQ respondents made up 4.51% and transgender and uh, gender non-binary folks made up 0.85%. Compared to the non-LGBTQ sample, there were fewer LGBTQ people in engineering and more in computer science and mathematics compared to non-LGBTQ peers. LG LGBTQ folks were also less represented in the for-profit sector but were comparable in government and in academia. Um, LGBTQ respondents on average were a few years younger as well, 47 compared to 50 for non-LGBTQ. On these bar graphs, we compare LGBTQ in gray with non-LGBTQ in white and show predicted means by LGBTQ status holding constant variation by demographics, employment and job characteristics, and professional society. These results show that with statistical significance that relative to their non-LGBTQ peers, LGBTQ STEM professionals experience lower career opportunities, less sufficient re resources, and less comfort in whistleblowing in their jobs. In their workplaces, LGBTQ professionals um, experience more devaluation of their STEM work uh, and, um, and more social exclusion. They're also around 33% more likely to have experienced harassment on the job. These workplace experiences are correlated with outcome measures, and here we use measures from standard psychological tests for stress and depression. LGBTQ professionals are significantly more likely to experience minor health problems, insomnia, to be stressed from work, and to experience depressive symptoms. This also has consequences for intent to leave STEM, as significantly more LGBTQ professionals have thought about leaving their STEM job and have plans to leave a STEM profession. The next paper explores a mechanism at the organizational level in relation to LGBTQ workplace experiences, and this paper is based on our NASA interview sample and the broader STEM inclusion study called LGBTQ at NASA and Beyond, Work Structure and Workplace Inequality Among LGBTQ STEM Professionals from the Journal Work and Occupations last year. The NASA IRB uh, required us to use these pseudonyms for the two NASA centers, NASA South and NASA East, and we also, all the names in the paper are also pseudonyms. When we studied these two NASA centers in our pilot data for the project, we were really perplexed 
to find that LGBTQ STEM professionals seem to fare better at the center in the South than they did at the center in the East. And this was perplexing because NASA South is located in a pretty anti-LGBTQ area, whereas NASA East is known to be in a kind of pro-LGBTQ area. So we were really perplexed by that. And one key difference between these two centers is the structure of work. NASA South is organized around missions that everyone works on and tends to feel connected to, while NASA East typically has uh, over 200 missions across its main and satellite campuses. And these projects are often organized in short-term project-based work groups, a work structure that is increasingly popular in industry. While the idea um, of uh, there being a NASA family was prevalent across both of these centers, uh, it was felt more strongly at NASA South where there were more social groups that met after hours and a deeper center-wide feeling of connection in the work. Um, uh, at NASA East, groups were continually reshuffled and colleagues um, had to, uh, and people had to uh, continually come out. One lesbian engineer said, I feel like I'm coming out all the time, always having to reestablish and renegotiate credibility and ascertain tolerance levels with new work coworkers in this matrix management structure. Ted, a straight male manager who described this work structure as being like Globetrotter's pickup basketball, told the story of Cassandra, a transgender woman engineer who had recently quit as people made fun of her all the time. However, at NASA South, uh, STEM professionals could, um, if they had a bad work group, they could eventually kind of maneuver into another work group for, a long, um, for their long-term careers. Uh, Bonnie, a transgender woman engineer, had undergone a transition over years and felt that while not all difficulties were overcome, at least 90% of the people in her unit accepted her and generally, general hostility had lessened as people had gotten to know her. So we wanted to know if this pattern was present in the larger sample of the STEM inclusion study and Aaron ran an analysis using an interaction term between LGBTQ and whether respondents were in dynamic project-based teams. Um, and she found that for LGBTQ persons in project-based work groups, there are statistically significant negative effects on being treated as an equally skilled professional fitting, and fitting in with others at work and an increase in feeling nervous or stressed at work. So the quantitative findings in the big sample confirmed what we were finding at NASA. So in summary, the two key findings from the first papers um, from the ongoing STEM inclusion study uh, using a nationally representative sample of U.S. STEM professionals find that sy systematic workplace disadvantages for LGBTQ persons and STEM professions with negative effects for health and intent to stay in STEM relative to non-LGBTQ peers. And uh, we also find increasingly popular project-based short-term work structures may exacerbate this LGBTQ inequality. This table uh, shows some of the overall demographics of our large interview sample. And next steps are some additional mixed methods comparisons using these subgroups and focusing on specific subgroups with qualitative data. I also have a book under contract with the University of Massachusetts Press, co-authored with Ethan Levine and Brandon Fairchild on the social history of the LGBTQ inclusion in STEM movement um, that we um, encountered while we were interviewing all these people. We found all these organizers. So um, this is gonna be called Outdoing Science. Um, and uh, that includes some additional interviews, interviews with LGBTQ professionals who are STEM organizers. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll now have Reginald Blockett, who is um, assistant professor at Auburn University. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Reginald Blockett. I use open and flexible pronouns, so I'm okay with the litany of them. I'm an assistant professor at Auburn University, and uh, my research program really kind of focuses in on the sociocultural experiences of queer and trans students of color in post-secondary contexts. I'm a professor of higher education. I'm particularly interested in how this population survive and persist in the face of anti-queer, anti-trans, and anti-black um, and brown policies, practices, and pedagogies. And so my work here today will draw from a multi-year uh, critical ethnography that I uh, developed to uh, really kind of understand this particular student group population. Um, I plan on uh, sort of covering a little bit about the just brief uh, experiences of STEM students uh, and field and I'm um, sorry STEM fields um, for queer, trans, and gender nonconforming learners. Um, look at a little bit about the study design that I'm, I'm reporting from, and then the findings and some implications. 
Um, several studies, uh, some of which were uh, reported on here today, or will be reported on here today, highlight the ways in which LGBTQ students experience isolation and onlyness in both academic and social spaces within STEM context. These forms of isolation become more severe uh, for students with multiple compounded oppressed social identities like LGBTQ students of color and or LGBTQ students who also have physical and cognitive disabilities. Um, some studies report that LGBTQ students experience STEM environments as non-affirming and unsafe, even uh, describing some educational and pedagogical practices in STEM fields as, quote, white, uh, cis-heteropatriarchal spaces. Um, a number of scholars uh, have also found that uh, some st uh, STEM instruction um, fosters epistemological violence uh, towards non-straight, uh, non-cisgender students. Um, I'm going to be really brief with this sort of study design, but I'm reporting on a, uh, a study from a critical ethnographic uh, work that uh, the cultural site for this study was located at a university LGBTQ center, resource center, uh, where the peer support group uh, that I work with met weekly throughout the academic year. I had the pleasure of joining the group as first a participant, then later as a participant observer uh, once trustworthiness was established and, um, and permissions were granted by the, uh, to conduct human research, uh, research human subject research. Uh, in years two and three of the study uh, da of data collection, uh, members decided to move the location from the upstairs room uh, that I just previously showed with bright fluorescent lighting to a, a more comfortable first floor uh, library within the LGBTQ center with more uh, soft lighting and affirming in imagery uh, in LGBTQ books surrounding their dialogic circle. Culturally rich, socially um, dynamic, and racially, sexually, and gender diverse, the peer support group was a dialogic was dialogic in nature, meaning that the space revolved around rich conversations that emerged from participants. Uh, the group was led by one or two co-facilitators um, who were both typically graduate students. So reporting on um, some of the data from this particular survey, I'm going to take a moment to read um, our uh, quote from a particular participant related to hostility in STEM academic spaces. So Alex um, reports, on campus for me, I get, and this student, I should say, was, re was responding to a question from a facilitator about um, their experiences as being uh, where they experience hostility um, as queer students on campus. They said, well, for me, I guess the only place that I ever think that uh, is a place where I want to avoid being openly gay would be in the engineering school because that's where the most conservatives kind of flock. I remember a last uh, time last year I was studying in the engineering building with a friend and another student that we didn't even know walked up and took my pink triangle button off my bag. Um, Alex is a, was a fourth year uh, queer gender nonconforming student majoring in biology. Um, this particular sequence took place in the year two of the study um, but it really kind of highlights this piece around hostility that this student experienced um, in the engineering school. Um, Michael, who was a second year uh, at the time, rising uh, third year PhD student in mathematics, um, I'm going to read this particular quote from Michael. Um, and it revolves around a exclusion and isolation in graduate mathematics. It's been hard for me as a PhD student in mathematics. The department has never graduated a black PhD student, so I really feel the weight of that as um, I approach my third year in the program. And I especially feel the weight as someone who is both black and queer. I was recounting the story of Alan Turner uh, turning uh, to classmates the other day, and they could care less about um, a particular popular gay mathematician who committed suicide. This was a mathematician in the 50s, um, but really just kind of, again, um, focuses in on this piece of on isolation and exclusion for certain students, particularly uh, doctoral students in mathematics, who also are bl uh, black and queer. Uh, this is a report from a student, uh, Rose, who uh, was a graduate student in a STEM field, um, and she explained that she really had to uh, sort of fight to be seen in a particular classroom. This theme is around being ignored by peers and faculty in engineering. Rose stated, um, I, never, I never get called on by the professor in my applied 
electromagnetics course. I am not a STEM person. Uh, uh, it's, it's, at it's at the point where I don't even try to speak up uh, in class anymore. And when I try to connect with other students in the class for project partners, um, similar to the partnerships that were just kind of sort uh, described that take place in the classrooms, I'm usually picked up, picked last, or paired with uh, one other you know, international student, for example. I just wish that there was at least one other queer Latina uh, in my classes so that I could uh, be partners with. Um, so um, this instance where um, this particular student, Rosa, um, talks about the realities of what it means to sort of experience loneliness and be ignored by both uh, faculty and students, uh, peers in the classroom space, and sort of what that means um, in the face of trying to major in a uh, engineering program, again, as a graduate student who experiences the sort of intersectionality of being both queer and Latina. Spend my last little bit talking about some implications that I see. Um, so one of the things that I think often about is what are we doing to sort of change and augment these environments uh, that all of us at some point in practice have talked about here today? Um, what does it look like for us to have more increased federal funding for LGBTQ um, and STEM pipeline programs? Uh, we started the day off, uh, Brian, talking about the sort of need to uh, fix this leaky, uh, weird pipeline that sort of exists. Um, well, we know that there's a number of foundations uh, like the Sloan Foundation that is working uh, to reduce the um, underrepresentation of minorities in STEM uh, by their um, linking uh, HBCU students to predominantly white institution students um, and trying to create and foster uh, more um, sp supportive spaces and programs that sort of uh, increase this pipeline to um, STEM education, particularly along the graduate education lines. Um, what does it look like for us to foster more uh, cross-cultural mentoring in STEM at graduate education? Um, um, graduate education is a, a big part of the STEM education uh, process, particularly through those pipeline programs. And what we're seeing is that a number of students, especially at the graduate level, are experiencing uh, tensions, hostilities with their advisors, with their faculty, with instructors, with mentors. So what does it look like for us to foster and sort of think more broadly about um, cross-cultural mentoring because that becomes so critical uh, during that moment? One of the ways that we might do this might be through incentivizing research teams and labs uh, comprised of diverse learners from LGBTQ populations. Um, again, recognizing that there is a uh, huge uh, momentum of intersectionality amongst this LGBTQ population, right? So these students are not just uh, one particular identity. They come to STEM programs from a number of different backgrounds. And then lastly, um, like the work of Langley um, and, and, their serve, um, sorry, uh, and their associates, we need to think more broadly about how do we reduce uh, hostile environments by measuring where the violence uh, is sort of concentrated at? Um, is it within graduate education specifically? Is it within um, engineering or mathematic programs specifically? Um, and so thinking about how do we sort of re reduce uh, hostile environments through uh, the measures that we have around STEM ecologies. Um, that is my time, thank you. And last but not least, we have Stephanie Farrell, who's professor at Rowan University. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm gonna to talk about uh, how LGBTQ folks navigate experiences of exclusion in the academy. And again, my name is Stephanie Farrell. I'm from Rowan University in New Jersey. Um, before I get started, I do wanna thank the hosting partners as well as the planning committee for, uh, for making this important event possible today. It's a pleasure to be here. So the work that I'm going to talk about is part of an ongoing project that uses a research education advocacy cycle to promote the inclusion of LGBTQ in STEM. And the research part focuses on aspects of engineering culture that serve as barriers to LGBTQ inclusion. The education efforts focus on research-informed safe zone workshops um, that were developed specifically for a STEM audience. And the advocacy efforts center around the work of a national community of practice that promotes LGBTQ inclusion in STEM. 
A project that grew out of the community of practice was this book, Unqueering STEM Culture. In the chapters of this edited volume, um, LGBTQ students, faculty, and staff in STEM fields in higher education share their stories in their own words. Their experiences as queer people in STEM are not monolithic. They're dynamic, they're multidimensional, they're very varied. Um, but with this diverse collection of experiences that are represented in the book, one can find common ideas and patterns of meaning in, in the experiences and the powerful stories. And there are themes about belonging, visibility, persistence, and purpose in STEM, and that's what I want to dig into a little bit in, in my talk today. So I'm going to share what I've learned um, working alongside the community and working alongside the authors um, when they wrote their chapters. And I'll do my best to amplify their voices without distorting the message. The first theme is that many LGBTQ individuals struggle to find a sense of belonging in STEM. Are you shocked? <laughs> Probably not. Um, but as you go through the accounts in, in this book, you really get a glimpse of what it's like to navigate a space that requires a high level of conformity with cis and hetero, cisgender and heteronormative expectations of behavior and expression. So as an example, um, I'll go to the chapter by Rachel, who, is, who has a BS and MS in engineering and is reflecting on a time when she was pursuing her PhD. Um, she, she found that, that um, she, or she, she describes her perceptions of these rigid expectations for behavior and performance in STEM and also the personal consequences of not conforming. And she writes, I expected myself to be perfect based on rules as I understood them that I wanted desperately to follow but was unable to hear, adhere to while being true to myself. That mismatch made me feel lesser than, lesser than those people who looked and acted like girls were supposed to act, lesser than those who succeeded academically in ways that for some reason seemed beyond my grasp, and lesser than real engineers who graduated and went to work in the profession. Well, this, this sense of um, the, the struggle to find belonging is not limited to the early stages of one's career. So we go to the chapter by Diane, and she, she identifies as a lesbian and shares the lack of belonging that she felt in academic administration. So she recollects a time in her career when she had already risen through all the faculty ranks. She had served in several leadership positions and was now serving in a high-level administrative position. And she wrote that she considered leaving administration because she did not seem to fit the mold of an administrator. She writes, a white, able-bodied, heterosexual male perspective seemed to be required or preferred for success. But it was then that I realized that individuals like me who didn't fit needed to be in leadership positions. So this leader stayed. The next theme is that LGBTQ individuals in STEM struggle to be visible, to be heard, and to be recognized. And in the chapters, authors describe their ongoing efforts to combat erasure. Exclusion from historical records or from current events, invalidation of their minority identity, or misidentification of that identity. As an example, we go to um, the chapter by Dave. And Dave is an engineering faculty member. Um, he identifies as a black gay male engineer. And he observes, observes that heterosexuality and masculinity are expected norms within STEM and describes how others perceive incongruity between his black masculinity and his queerness. He says, when confronted with my identity and the dissonance formed by their perceptions of black masculinity and queerness, for those who are less aware of how to proceed, three types of responses come forth. I would never have known, you don't seem gay, or how do you know, 
or why didn't you tell me before? And the fourth theme is, is that finding community and support is essential for LGBTQ individuals to find belonging, to thrive, and to persist in STEM. When we go back to the chapter by, by Rachel, who was a PhD student and, and who was tired of hiding herself at work. At the time that she's reflecting on during her PhD studies, she had yet to embrace an integrated STEM identity and LGBTQ identity. She was living separate lives and found this to be exhausting. At that time, um, she became a founding member of the, the community of practice for LGBTQ inclusion in STEM, and she describes the profound impact that the community of practice had on her. She, she writes, being accepted into the community of practice changed the focus of my dissertation, my career, and my life. I had once again found my people, my purpose, and my success. And the last theme that emerged from the author's stories was that LGBTQ experiences with exclusion, hostility, and discrimination increase empathy and motivate work for social change. These are the individuals who persisted in STEM. Many leave, um, but, but uh, for these authors, um, their work for social change brings a sense of purpose and determination to persist in STEM with hopes of ensuring that things are better for the next generation. So as an example, we go to the chapter by Mike, who is also an engineering faculty member, a, a gay male, um, and he describes how his career blossomed when he found trust, when he found collaboration and belonging with the, in the community of practice for LGBTQ inclusion in STEM. He explains that the profound effect that this support and new, newfound professional capital had on his work as an engineering professor. He writes, now that I have professional currency to spend, I hope to repay that debt and use my remaining career paving that rough path for other marginalized engineers in hopes for a future where people are truly valued for both their talents and their humanity. So I find it inspiring that, that folks can endure such negative experiences and yet emerge with even more strength and determination to persist and to, to make things better for the next generation. But this is not enough. We need to do more. Um, what can we do to, to cultivate a professional landscape that's better than the one that we inherited? So synthesizing some of the lessons learned from the author's journeys, we can make the following recommendations. We need to understand LGBTQ experiences in STEM and the underlying mechanisms that produce inequality. We need to address the disparities in retention and success of LGBTQ individuals in STEM. And of course, this requires data at, at the institutional and professional and federal level. We need to understand aspects of STEM culture that either impede or, or support LGBTQ inclusion. And we need to make ma macro level efforts to change organizational culture and systems through policy and practice. And I would just like to thank the National Science Foundation for supporting this work. Do these work? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I, this has just been such a stellar panel, and to have um, effectively the world's leading experts on this issue all here um, in such an emerging um, and sort of neglected um, research area has been really phenomenal. Um, I'm shocked that with seven academics we went over on time, um, <laughs> but um, I want to sort of collapse a number of questions into sort of one, one complex question I want to ask um, all the, the panelists um, and then hopefully open it up to the audience for questions. Um, the first part of the question is um, there's of course you know an extensive STEM education literature, um, higher education literature and there you know in your own empirical observations um, you know 
what can we say about the unique differences and then also the similarities between other underrepresented groups? So how women, racial and ethnic minorities, those with disabilities navigate the STEM, you know, their STEM pathways. Um, what can we say about LGBTQ plus people? And of course these intersect as a number of your talks showed. Um, but one thing that's coming to mind and as some of your talks um, mentioned was visibility, right? We have a, a, a typically invisible identity that has to be disclosed, right? So what what can we, how can we draw on this extensive um, literature um, to, to make sense of LGBTQ plus uh, STEM pathways. Um, and the second question is, of course, what, what do your own, you know, your data, your observations suggest about uh, changes and, you know, policies that we could, um, that or kind of structural, um, whether it's structural changes or kind of um, institutional changes or individual kind of leadership changes um, in terms of how to remedy these issues, um, has does your data do your data weigh in on that at all? So, anyone want to start? How about me? Perfect. Okay. I just want to say, um, listening to these talks, it was amazing. Um, we were all studying kind of different phases of scientific training, and it's amazing how these data complemented each other so much. And I was, of course, talking about a stage of high school and then later training stages. But um, I think, you know, I've been studying um, uh, racial, ethnic, and gender diversity in STEM for a long time. And I think one of the things that's been illuminating about the research is that there's specific barriers and complexities that racial and ethnic minorities face. And then there's these intersectional complexities that uh, folks experience as LGBTQ people. Um, and it was, you know, it's the first time I've really encountered data about how impactful the experiences of violence and anti-SGM bullying, specific literal experiences of violence, um, just uh, reduce the likelihood that you're going to continue in a STEM field. Um, it's really powerful to see that. And then when you move into the later training stages, it's really about career planning and where can I go as an LGBTQ person in science. And not just, you know, will my environment be accepting, but also if my research program addresses LGBTQ health disparities, there's not a lot of institutes around to do that work. And there's no pathway set up for how to accomplish that work. Um, and I, can, I think I attribute this to the lack of visibility and um, funding opportunities to do this work. And even for those not doing LGBTQ related work, I think the issue of disclosure and visibility is, is tremendously important. If you're navigating coming out, for instance, we saw with one of our um, uh, research participants, you're navigating coming out as trans and you're also training to be a scientist. Something has to give in those tremendously, you know, cognitively heavy experiences. Um, so those are two things I'm reflecting on that really get at the specificity of LGBTQ experiences in general. I was thinking about your question, actually, I think Aaron may have written about this. You made a comment earlier about the devaluation of femininity in science. And it does feel like when we look at the data on LGBTQ students in STEM, the patterns look a lot like they have for gender for as long as gender has been studied in science. So I would imagine there's a strong link there. And I believe, I do believe Aaron and some other folks have written about the fact that that may be underlying a lot of what we're seeing about LGBTQ experiences in STEM. I mean, I mean, think about when you had emailed me with regard to the, the interaction that I had tested in the, that first paper, literally it was, if you look at the four groups, sexual minor, or, uh, heterosexual men, sexual minority men, heterosexual women, sexual minority women, heterosexual men's per probability of persisting in STEM was much higher, sexual minority men was quite a bit lower, and then both heterosexual and sexual minority women were lower than that and very close to each other. But all three of those groups were kind of clustered together. So statistically speaking, I definitely think there's some patterns there. But your question got me thinking about why I first looked into this in the first place. And it's because I was working on a, 
I was a PhD student at UCLA working on a large STEM education project under Dr. Sylvia Hurtado, and a lot of our focus was on race and ethnicity and what factors led uh, underrepresented students to persist within their STEM degrees. And I was reading a qualitative study that I believe, I mean, I wish I could find this study and find this quote, because I can remember this moment, but I can't remember what I was reading. <laughs> it was when you're a grad student and you're reading so much. But I want to say it was a study on women of color in STEM undergraduate programs. Is it Carloni and Johnson's? Um... No, well, that one stands out to oh, me for a different was... reason. That's just a, no, no, this, this, was, a, this was a qualitative study on um, undergraduate women in, in STEM. And I think it was women of color. And there was a quote by a participant in there. And all of a sudden, it caused me to think, wow, that quote really resonates. Like, did my own experience as an undergraduate being a well, somewhat openly gay, not in my engineering classes, but elsewhere on campus. But it caused me to think about that, like, wow, I've never thought about that being a reason why, I, at least it's not putting the pieces together that way. And so I, I think there's also that question of, like, minoritization in general and exclusion in general, and that intersectionality would open up around how different uh, dimensions of marginality and different men dimensions of minoritization intersect relate um, and point to, um, again, I guess if we should, I, I'll invoke Aaron again with the <laughs> systematic advantages paper um, in ways that have allowed people whose intersections of privilege and intersections of being in dominant groups have not created barriers and not stood in the way of their participation. And I, to me, it points all to the, the overall training process, how do we get faculty, mentors, people who have some authority, who have some influence, to be able to start reshaping the culture and really transforming the lives of trainees um, as a key step forward. Thanks. <clears throat> Just a quick observation, but um, the, the devaluation of, femi of femininity and, and the sort of exacerbated underrepresentation and retention failure of sexual minority men. What's interesting about Joel's analyses, I think, is that, is it right, Joel, that heterosexual women or women in the aggregate are earning more higher ed degree, I mean, college degrees than men, like double the rate or something like that, roughly? Yeah. So. Um in more, in more recent cohorts, there's a lot of attention to the problem of boys in education, and uh, especially post-pandemic boys, college uh, enrollment and graduation rates have plummeted. And uh, in my data, when I pin down to look at the different subgroups, uh, gay men stand out as having, um, of all groups that I study, just uh, astronomically high rates of um, academic success, and yet, um, as we've seen in some of the other data, uh, that success does not translate into STEM fields. And um, in particular, there's some new research that I'm advising showing that um, gay men don't seem to receive the same economic payoff for their academic investments. And part of it is precisely because they're funneled out of these more high prestige, high paying fields. Yeah, I think it just further situates STEM in a broader context of higher ed that just shows how quite bad things are in <laughs> STEM. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah. Um, I, was, I would just say, um, as a higher ed scholar, and as somebody who very much is a critical scholar, I'm all about um, you know studying students thriving and studying their success, right? And we have a lot of robust agenda of research that studies student success at the institutional level. Most of us present it in some capacity on you know the, the graduation rates and the amount of completers, but many of us also talk about students who are non-completers who at the undergraduate and graduate level. And so I you know I sort of question. Um, um, that second part of, of your question, John, like the structural changes in policy, um, what does it mean for us to start to ask the questions of what happened along the way to those students who are non-completers? Um, one of my students, Michael, who was uh, in this multi-year ethnographic study, um, what, I, what I did not share here was that Michael did not finish the mathematics degree. They transferred to um, uh, aero, aerospace physics, I believe. Um, all that to say, um, you know, what does it mean for us to think about the folks who are not 
not thriving in these particular areas? And how do we create structures and reconstitute the way that we've understood uh, STEM pedagogy to think about uh, teaching from the bottom up, right, for the folks who are, who are not being seen, not being sought out within classroom spaces and in um, and research, uh, you know, spaces with, with STEM faculty. So that's just my two cents. I think that there's a need to sort of think about the folks who are not really thriving in these spaces as well.